This year, TYT has been making a lot of moves. Now you can too. Now how are you going to do that? You want to launch a new business? That sounds fun. You're going to change careers. Jesus and Lord mercy. You're going to need a website for all that. Lucky for you, Squarespace also making moves. You're going to go to squarespace.com slash TYT. You're going to get 10% off your first purchase. And you're going to get to build anything you want on that website with a unique domain. What are you, crazy? Go do it now. Go. As if President Trump didn't already have enough to fume about, a grassroots campaign recently stripped him of millions of dollars of quarterly income derived from a property that had been known as Trump Soho. State pension funds who are you know, fiduciaries, who have obligations uh, to protect the retirees and the beneficiaries of state workers, police officers, firefighters, nurses, those types of people, they invest in private equity funds. And what happened here is that CalPERS, New York State Common Retirement Fund, nine other state and local pension funds invested in a private equity fund called CIM Fund 3. And that private equity fund ended up taking over the Trump Soho Hotel in 2015 through foreclosure. They agreed to continue paying the Trump Organization millions in fees to market and manage the Trump Soho. You have state pension funds like CalPERS and New York State who are paying millions in fees to the private equity fund every quarter, and then the private equity fund is turning around and paying that money directly to the Trump Organization. President Trump reported on his June 2017 financial disclosures that he received over $2.8 million in income from that particular Trump organization. The reason that Free Speech for People got involved there is because the framers and the founders of the United States were very concerned about self-dealing and corruption. The framers were absolutely obsessed with the, the problems that you raised, which is that it's very easy for people who are corrupt to amass power, and so they really wanted to make sure that the Constitution had safeguards to prevent that from happening. So there's a clause in the Constitution called the Domestic Emoluments Clause, and what that says is that neither the United States nor any of the states individually can compensate or provide a profit to the president um, other than the salary that he's provided for serving as president. And so we thought it was a, a pretty easy case for the pension funds to understand why the investment in a fund that was then using fees that were being paid to pay the president was illegal and was something that they needed to take action on. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when we sent letters uh, to the pension funds calling this to their attention, they didn't respond in the way that we expected. Uh, they essentially said, it's not a direct contract with the president, um, and we don't know what happens to the fees that we pay to the private equity fund. All we're concerned about is whether or not uh, we get a good return on investment. Yeah. And so we started a, a campaign called Divest Trump Soho. Thousands of people signed a petition calling on the state pension funds to consider divestment. And we had several back and forths um, with the pension funds offering different types of remedies that you know, would help them to really extricate themselves and their pensioners um, from this illegal scheme. One of those would have been to divest completely from the fund, but another option that we put on the table was for them to engage with the private equity fund manager uh, to terminate the agreement with the Trump organization. So after you know, months of back and forth, thousands of people writing in, several people actually showing up at the board meetings of the CalPERS pension fund and Representative Ted Lieu from California leading 11 of his colleagues in filing a letter with CalPERS calling on them to take action. Now the private equity fund manager is buying out the Trump organization and taking the Trump name off of Trump Soho. I saw the letter that members of Congress sent, and uh, they talk about legal, fiduciary, and ethical obligations. And this violation of the Constitution that you mentioned, isn't that really Trump's violation of the Constitution? Not these hedge fund managers. I mean, Trump chose not to divest, as all other presidents have done from his businesses. 
How were you able to convince them that they were in violation of the Constitution? Well, we'll never, we'll never actually hear from the hedge fund that they were violating the Constitution. So I should be clear about that. It's clear that President Trump is prohibited from receiving those funds. And the thing that we were hanging our arguments on is the fact that the pension funds have, as we said, legal and ethical obligations that meant that they needed to stop being a part of this illegal scheme. Pension funds have broad discretion in how they invest their funds, but that discretion only goes up to the limits of the law. So what would happen if CalPERS had invested in a private equity fund and it turned out that one of the assets that was that was held in that fund was found to be laundering money. Um, you know, you wouldn't want the pension fund to stay in that investment, even if they were getting a good return, because it was violating the law. Well, that's not a hypothetical. And it's not a, this is the thing. So, so here's the issue. So the domestic emoluments clause is what brought us to this case. Um, but the Trump Soho has this amazingly troubled history. And it turns out that the Trump Soho is really one of the assets that's at the center of special counsel Mueller's investigation into the Trump Russia conspiracy, but also into the Trump organization writ large. The Trump Soho was announced at the end of the 2007 season of The Apprentice. And it was really supposed to be Donald Jr. and Ivanka's first foray into taking over the brand. They came up with this co-developing group. It included a firm called Bayrock uh, and another firm called Saper. And one of the principals involved in this was a man named Felix Sater. Yeah. So Felix Sater turns out to be the guy who sent an email to one of Trump's attorneys saying, our boy can be president and we can make it happen. I'll get Putin's you know, people in line on this. So that is one of the co-developers of the Trump Soho. Now that's only one piece of the story though, because it turns out 2008, as you may remember, wasn't a great time to be selling real estate. And that was around the time that they were taking Trump Soho to market. And so there were claims uh, from some of the people who had purchased condo units there that Donald Jr. and Ivanka and other members of the Trump organization had fraudulently told them that more units had been sold than was actually the case and that they had inflated the value of those units. And so that civil fraud case was going on in much of 2010 and 2011. Wait, hypothetically, what would happen if they just made some campaign contributions to the Manhattan prosecutor and those charges just went away, would they be home free or are there other levels of enforcement that could come after them? That's a great hypothetical that you <laughs> ask. So, so I was talking about the civil case and what happened in the civil case was that the Trump organization paid the plaintiffs in the civil case to drop their suit. Okay. But the Manhattan District Attorney's Office was actually investigating to determine whether or not criminal fraud had occurred in this case. And it turns out, based on re great reporting that was done by uh, The New Yorker and ProPublica, that Mark Kasowitz, um, who is a Trump, a longtime Trump attorney, had donated money just before and just after the criminal investigation was dropped by Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance. There have been a lot of questions raised about whether that donation um, to the Manhattan DA was actually an attempt at bribery to get him to drop the criminal fraud case. So, so you can see that you know it's not just the domestic emoluments clause yeah. here that that makes you wonder about what a state pension fund is doing remaining invested in a property like this, and that's not the end of it. So. The Financial Times, which is a really well-known London paper, did an in-depth investigation of whether or not someone who had ties to the Kazakhstan government, an oligarch, essentially, in Kazakhstan, was laundering money through Trump Soho units. And they essentially concluded that um, the former energy minister from Kazakhstan had purchased three Trump Soho units to launder money that he had illegally gotten um, in Kazakhstan. Stolen from his government? Stolen from his government. Yeah. And so that's yet another reason that the Mueller investigation has really been taking a close look at Trump Soho. 
Now, let's just explain about money laundering. So when you have this sort of kleptocracy, like the Russian Federation, I guess Kazakhstan seems to be one, where the government and organized crime is basically one entity. For some reason, they come to people like Trump to launder their money so that who won't know? Like, who do they even have to worry about if they have money that they've stolen from the people, from the government? What, who do they have to fool? Right. Well, in the case of Kazakhstan, um, there, you know, there were governments in transition. So oh, okay. um, he was a former energy minister fleeing the country. So he needed to get his money out of Kazakhstan and into some other vehicle. And the way that he did that was allegedly to purchase Soho condominium units. In the case of you know, folks in the, the Russian Federation, it depends. They may be businessmen who are operating not only in Russia, um, but also in other nations. OK, um, so then they would be liable in, in, under the justice systems of those nations. Right. OK. That's why they money launder. Right. I see. Cause or it may be that they're, you know, if it's, <laughs> if it's the you know, Russian organized crime, um, then even in Russia, some of the stuff that they're doing is not legal. Um, in that oh, if case, you're not a friend of Putin's, <laughs> right. you could actually you be... You could actually end up yeah, oh, in trouble. you could get in trouble. Okay, yeah. okay. Ashley Avery says, thank you for putting your time into this for all of us. And she gives a little heart symbol. She also had a question. Is there any situation where any of Trump's assets could be seized? I don't know. It would just make me kind of happy. <laughs> So there is, um, we, we have something called the forfeiture um, laws uh, or provisions. So what that means is, is that when an asset is being used in furtherance of a crime, uh, the DOJ or the police, uh, who, whoever is the person prosecuting that crime, can uh, take that asset. Um, so it is possible that, you know, if Special Counsel Mueller determines that there was money laundering taking place or it, uh, that money laundering is taking place at Trump Soho, that that asset could end up being forfeited to the federal government. Now, whether or not that will happen, um, you know, criminal investigations can take a, a very long amount of time, um, but it certainly would make, you would think, make someone who is a private equity fund nervous about whether or not it could end up being forfeited to the government. A grand jury in the District of Columbia today returned an indictment presented by the special counsel's office. The indictment charges 13 Russian nationals and three Russian companies for committing federal crimes while seeking to interfere in the United States political system, including the 2016 presidential election. The defendants allegedly conducted what they called information warfare against the United States. I think there are divides in our country that make us um, uniquely susceptible. Um, I think the Russians know that we're vulnerable. They clearly tried to play on some of the racial divides in our country, some of the religious divides in our country with the ads that they were putting yeah, out yeah. Um, during the course of the election. And I think had a very clear understanding of what it was about our country that made us susceptible to this. Because if you really believe that there's a, a culture war, a war on Christmas, a war on white people, you know, in this country and that these immigrants and these people of color, the Obama coalition is attacking you, whatever threat that Russia and its nuclear weapons that are pointed at our country, that's remote possibility, but you definitely have neighbors speaking Spanish. <laughs> right. right. Well, and, you know, as a child of the 80s um, who grew up, you know, towards the end of the Cold War and, and remembers Red Dawn um, yeah. As, yeah. as one of the big movies of the time, it has been shocking to me to see the number of people who are not concerned about the positive statements that Trump was making about Russia, you know, during the campaign, right. um, but also don't seem concerned now that it's clear that, that Russia you know, had um, a plan to intervene in the election, don't seem to be upset about that at all because of the culture war um, narrative that's well, out see, there. Now, what if they wanted to help the other side of the culture war? What if they said, hey, we're going to help the immigrants and we're going to help black people have equal rights. We're going to help gays and lesbians. And then they had a presidential candidate that they helped to win. How do you think Republicans would be reacting to that? Well, I think we would already be seeing impeachment hearings uh, moving forward. So I have a great comment that I can't wait to get your response to. This uh, person named Dean Wayne has merely said, she's a communist. <laughs> that's, that's great. So. I'm actually the one who is concerned about 
conspiracies with Russia, <laughs> the nation that tried to spread communism throughout the globe, and, and this person assumes that I'm a communist. That's very interesting. Uh, it also might be worth knowing um, that I grew up in Texas in the South. Um, and uh, and I, there, communist just means interracial like <laughs> power, right? It just means civil rights. That's what communist right. means. It means equal right. rights for people who aren't white. Uh, right. So um, so yeah, that's um, it, it. Is really it's strange to me. This but are is, you guilty of wanting equal rights for people who are not white? Well, what I want is equal justice under the law for everyone. So communist clearly. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, the founding fathers would probably say that I am. Uh, uh, small r Republican, um, because that's what I want. Um, but, you know, communist, Republican, maybe there's not so much of a difference these days. No, 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 no. <laughs> See, it, communist never meant communist here. It no, never I meant know, communist. That what they meant, you know, they, they went after Martin Luther King, communist, right? right? They put up those billboards about that camp where they were training the civil rights leaders, right. and they said it's a communist camp. They were trying to say, we want you to be even more afraid of equal justice under the law for African Americans than right. you already are. So let's involve this idea of communists and Russians and we'll right. call them communists. And it yeah. also allowed J. Edgar Hoover to persecute and, and, exactly. and to, to try to basically to undermine the civil rights movement. Right. But it's now that Russia is trying to further the preservation of white rule in this country. Hmm. Now the white supremacists march to Russia is our friend. The South will rise again. Russia is our friend. The South will rise again. That's what they say. I'm not making this That's up. That's amazing. That's what they <laughs> march to. Russia is our friend. Right? And, wow. the, and the Jews will not replace us. Yeah, the second I had heard, I had not heard the Russia is our friend. That is truly amazing. And, and actually, I, I've spoken to people who really kind of have done a lot of research on the white supremacist movement. And mm -hmm. this started earlier, even before hmm. Trump. It was because of Putin's persecution of gays and lesbians. It's, it's the way he's treating his people. He's brutalizing his people in the right. way that these white supremacists would like to see our leaders do, but not toward them, toward those people. Towards the, gays the minorities. And minorities. And the, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. We typically, if we talk about Russia, we receive comments not just from people on the right, mm -hmm. but there are also people on the left who have grown tired of that issue dominating when there are other things at hand. What would you say to people on the left? who are saying, no, no, still don't believe it, no, no, still don't want to hear about it. Well, I would say it's really important to know that Russia isn't only doing this to the U.S. It's clear that they also interfered in the Brexit referendum. Um, they've also mm -hmm. been trying to interfere in other Western European elections. Um, and so the reason that we have to grapple with this and we have to understand what happened is so that we can make sure that they're not able to interfere with our free elections um, in 2018 or in 2020 or any time in the future. Heather Bastian says, so is this grounds for treason? Everybody's, everybody knows a lot or knows probably more than they want to know <laughs> about the potential of, of uh, conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russian military intelligence. But free speech for people has been focused primarily on financial self-dealing that in the Constitution it says you cannot do. Right. Whether it's with foreign powers or in business in, within the United States, the foreign emoluments clause, domestic emoluments. That's why D Donald Trump has just lost millions of dollars. Um, right. The work that you've done began with that, even if this other stuff was, as you addressed earlier. Ends up earlier. being part of it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Because I'm not sure what Heather is focused on when she says this, this grounds for treason. Is it treason to use public office for self-enrichment financially? So I wouldn't call it treason. Uh, what I would call it is a violation of the Constitution. And again, let's go back to what the founders were thinking about when they put these emoluments clauses into the Constitution. You know, one of the, the key things that they were concerned about was the possibility of foreign governments or of individual states or of members of Congress corrupting the president by giving him financial gains that would make him act in the interest of the people who were giving him the money um, or in his own interest as opposed to the interest of the United States and its people. Um, so 
that gets to really kind of the foundational question of what the president's responsibility is in that office, and that is to protect the Constitution and to protect the security and the interests of the United States. And so it's, it's not necessarily treason for him to engage in this self-dealing, but it is corruption that is violating the Constitution and that is rendering him unfit to, to hold office. Okay, so I'm gonna free you to go international if you want, um, but we know about all the Trump hotels within the United States, um, and there were Trump hotels being built in some very peculiar places around the world uh, where there are human rights violations and other sort of national security issues. So I'm gonna give you your pick, but where has there been a decision that has been made by our government since Trump was inaugurated that you think was not in the best interest of the American people, but rather pursuing a personal financial interest for Trump and his family? Well, I'll give you one um, that comes from the environmental context. And, and before I was with Free Speech for People, I, I did a lot of work on energy and environmental law. And you know, this is one that I, I think hasn't gotten a lot of coverage. But as you know, um, the Trump Organization owns 12 golf courses in the US. They also own some international golf courses. And the EPA uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers uh, under the Obama administration had developed a rule called the Waters of the US. And the purpose of that rule was really to ensure that the drinking water um, for all people in the United States was being adequately protected. And so it made um, what had been a, a really muddy area of the law, uh, sorry, I didn't intend that pun, um, <laughs> but it made what had been a, a really ambiguous area of the law uh, much clearer. It set up categories of types of waters that, that would definitely be considered waters of the United States. And so if a developer was planning to renovate a golf course, you know, maybe so that the PGA could hold uh, the women's tour there Another or maybe a seniors uh, mm -hmm. a tournament there, um, then the golf course owner would have had to apply for permits, uh, which can cost thousands of dollars. They would have had to be more careful about when they applied pesticides. Um, you know, they, they would have had to take a lot more uh, actions than they would have otherwise. So one of the first things that Trump did when he came into office was he signed an executive order. This was in February. Uh, basically telling the EPA to rescind the waters of the U.S. rule that the Obama administration had developed. He's directing the EPA, the federal government, to get rid of a rule that likely would have cost him thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially, at each of the golf courses he owns. And he's doing so at the expense of protections that are meant to keep people safe in terms of drinking water. To me, the fact that he's willing to put profits before public health uh, and the public health of his own citizens is one of the most craven acts that we've seen. If you like this interview and you're at the end, so apparently you liked it a little bit, thank you for watching, we really appreciate it. You can watch them live as they happen if you're a member, only members get that. Go to tytnetwork.com slash join and you get not only interviews live, you get the Young Turks live, you get Aggressive Progressive live, old school and all the commercial free. Come join us right now, tytnetwork.com slash join.